All right, welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. My name is Guy McPherson. My mission is to raise the awareness of trauma and to support and inspire new trauma therapists just starting out on the trauma-informed journey. I do that with my membership community, Trauma Therapist 2.0, my online courses and workshops, and the Trauma Therapist newsletter. If you're a therapist of any kind and you work with individuals who've been impacted by trauma, I invite you to head on over to my website at the Trauma Therapist project.com. That's the trauma therapist project.com. All right, let's get started. All right, folks, welcome back to the trauma therapist podcast. I am thrilled to have as my guest today, Dr. Hillary McBride. Hillary, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure to be with you. All right. So Dr. McBride is a registered psychologist, a researcher, and a podcaster with expertise that includes working with trauma, trauma therapies, and embodiment at the intersection of spirituality and mental health. Her first book, Mothers, Daughters, and Body Image, Learning to Love Ourselves as We Are, was published in 2017. Her most recent book, The Wisdom of Your Body, Finding Wholeness, Healing, and Connection Through Embodied Living, came out in the fall of 2021. The book offers a compassionate, healthy, and holistic perspective on embodied living, weaving together illuminating research, stories from Dr. McBride's work as a therapist, and deeply personal narratives of healing from a life-threatening eating disorder, a near-fatal car accident, and chronic pain. All right, cheery. Here we go. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Look, Don't thanks so much. I feel for... so pleased to be covering all of these really, really difficult things right off the bat. <laughs> I appreciate you you coming on here. Before we get going, Hillary, share with our listeners where you're from originally and where you are currently. Yeah. So I am born and raised in Vancouver, BC and just made a move to Victoria, BC. So I live on an Island off the West coast of Vancouver, but it's a, a short boat or plane ride to Vancouver. So I still, I still think of that as home in a way. Awesome. Awesome. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's dive in here. How did you get here? How oh. did you get to be oh. working in this field? Yes. Oh, I love the question. And isn't it so rich to talk about our personal narratives that impact our work as clinicians and researchers, because I'm sure someone on your podcast before has said, research is always me search. And I think there's often something that happens for us as clinicians in which we are working our own stuff out, hopefully in ways that are ethical and allow the, the, the stories of our clients to be front and center. But I feel like my story to become a therapist and a clinician is so woven into mm. kind of my own work and the work of other people. So I love, I love the question. Um, I mean, there's a few different angles I can take to this. One is that I have two therapist parents. And so I could probably laugh and say, did I have any other choice? <laughs> I mean, I, I tried really hard to have a few different careers. Did I tried, you? yes, I started, um, my first degree was in performance violin. So I was a violinist and then really felt like that didn't allow my kind of my psyche to breathe in the way that I wanted it to. There were some ways that I was approaching being a musician that I think were deeply woven into the eating disorder kind of story in my head around perfectionism and rigor and this kind of like, um, do everything right. And mm -hmm. only see the one thing that you, you know, that you didn't do right and fixate on that. And so it felt like my eating disorder and my, my musicianship were in bed together. And then I tried to be a midwife for a little while and really wanted to be with birthing women. But I think the, the real thing that called me into work around trauma was an incident that I had while on a drive with my husband, I would say maybe about seven years ago. I think I was, I was in the process of becoming a therapist. I was in graduate school and I was in the car and I woke up and from a nap. I was in the passenger seat, woke up to having a panic attack. And I remember feeling really confused because that was not something that I had experienced a lot of. I think there had been episodes of panic here and there, but this was robust. This was gripping in a way that I hadn't experienced before. And as I sat up in the passenger seat, I looked out the window and the exact spot that we were in as we were driving, as I was having this panic attack was, was a spot in the road in which I'd had a near fatal car accident. And there was something about that episode of panic as it was integrated into place that got my attention. Mm. 
it kind of shook me and it said, there's something that your body is trying to tell you. There's something about the way that you have stored memory in your physiology that is trying to get your attention right now. Mm -hmm. And it felt to me like my body was saying, this is a place like I, I can imagine drawing a circle around that spot on the map, that geography and saying, this is a place that was really scary for you. And your body knows that it needs a little bit of extra protection when you come into this sp specific space. Now, what I find so fascinating about that experience was that I wasn't conscious, right? My mm -hmm. body knew where I was, even though right. I thought I was kind of drifting off into a nap. And so it, I mean, there's something kind of mystical about the way that our bodies help us survive trauma. There's something kind of mystical about the ways that our bodies remember, even when our conscious awareness doesn't, mm -hmm. when our kind of acute, or maybe what we could say, like declarative memory seems to be offline. Our body holds the stories of what we've been through, even when we aren't conscious of it. And so that awareness of place and memory and really seeing it as well through the angle of my body, trying to protect my existence got my attention in a way that I couldn't ignore and started me down this path of researching and really studying how to be a good steward of our bodies, especially as it relates to the trauma that is unprocessed, the trauma that is alive in the way that we move through the world. So of course there are several other branches to my work as you, um, as people who have been following my work for some time or have read my, my research or my books know, but I think at the heart of this, the heart of what I do is is to invite us back into connection with ourselves in, into a connection that feels loving and tender and compassionate, even when it feels like, you know, maybe the stories that we have about our bodies make it hard to do that. And I think that that's, as I was alluding to, as I started, that's of interest to me because that's been my work. How do I befriend my bodily knowing when it would be really easy to hate the panic, when it would be really easy to hate the distress, to actually be in loving, tender relationship with it and believe that somehow it is good and somehow it is for me. When did that experience happen in the car? How long ago was that? About seven years ago, okay. I'd say. Yeah. And then the accident would have been a few years before that. And what you just described is... I mean, incredible. I mean, just the way you articulate it was, mm -hmm. was really clear and, and I think cogent but when you woke up, however, my guess is it didn't come out like that. Right. What was your experience when you did wake up and you were in that moment? Yeah. I remember there was two parts of me. There was the, I feel very afraid and I feel like I'm going to die part, which is so typical of panic and flashbacks and kind of the trauma remembering and then there was also this hint of recognition, this awareness, as I looked around me, almost like I was nodding to myself, mm -hmm. like, oh, this makes sense. And I think that's, I think that's important to note because for a lot of us, um, the experiences of panic feel fragmented out from the knowing of what's causing it. When we have these implicit memories that are alive and working themselves out in our daily life, we might not know what the trigger was. We might not even remember it because maybe it wasn't in our lifetime. Like when we think about epigenetic change and intergenerational trauma, sometimes our bodies are reacting to things that happened to our ancestors. So the fact that I was able to know this place makes sense of this reaction and then also have the clinical awareness, uh, unlike many people to go, oh, my body is telling the story of this place and it's not something wrong with me. This is a trauma response that felt very unique. And in that way, I could feel both my kind of the traumatized self and the person of the clinician online at that moment, having a dialogue with each other. You uh, mentioned an eating disorder. Where mm -hmm. was that in relation in terms of time wise uh, in yes. relation to this? Yeah. So at this point, I would say that I was very much in remission. Although what I do think is important to acknowledge is that there is something about my my treatment of my trauma, particularly I have had a number of car near fatal car accidents the the going into my body to process the trauma of these accidents invited me to see that there was things that lingered from the eating disorder that, although I didn't have symptoms were not quite healed. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And I think this is one of the bones that I have to pick with psychology as a discipline is that so many of us in the discipline have been trained to see symptom resolution or symptom reduction as a marker of healing without actually asking, but is the person flourishing? So I could mm-hmm. say my symptoms had disappeared, but did I know how to inhabit myself in a way that was loving and tender? Did I believe that my body was good and for my fullness? Not really, but I didn't have symptoms at that time. So you had this experience. Mm-hmm. Um, how do things unfold in terms of the work you wanted to do or saw yourself doing or was inspired to do because of Mm -hmm. this. Yeah. And I find myself wondering, as you asked that my personal work or my clinical work, not that they're necessarily. However you want to take that question. um, Uh You know, I guess the work around, I guess we could step aside and say here, you know, what is your mission right now? Mm. What do you, what do you, who are you speaking to? Who, yeah. what, what are you addressing? Yeah. I think that this awareness that my body was good and was trying to protect my existence gave me a new way of understanding bodies and gave me a new way of understanding my own body in a way that asked me to see more of myself than I think the limited stories of bodies and my body that I had been given by our culture. So to, to look at bodies as alive and vibrant and wise was something that I don't quite think that I'd encountered up until that point. It was kind of like my, um, my experience gave me a new reality. It was kind of a bottom up knowing, so to speak, we use that language in in therapy all the time, the kind of bottom up versus top down knowing or processing. I had this reality shift this awareness shift that got my attention in a way that, that started to reorganize my worldview. And the deeper that I got into this new shift or new story, the more that I saw that it kind of, kind of spread out into all of these other areas. Like when we believe that our bodies are good and are for us, then we have the courage and the capacity to turn towards our emotion and investigate. When we believe that our bodies are good, we might not want to silence the sensation or the knowing that we have. But in addition to that, outside of the individual, when we believe that bodies are good and are worth paying attention to, it starts to ask us to reorganize the sociocultural hierarchies, which create um, a fragmentation of power based on which bodies have been valued the most culturally. Mm -hmm. So there's something about connecting to the body for me that made me realize this is part of my wholeness individually, but working with the body is also part of our collective wholeness. It's something, it has something to do with how we, how we need to move forward to heal but also, as I was mentioning, move beyond just healing in terms of symptom reduction, but look at how do we thrive individually and collectively? So I would say like most other therapists, like most other people who are trying to be conscious and kind of wake up to the things that don't work in our own lives and in our culture, I want, I want to see how the body is a part of that. And I want to push the body into our field of awareness to ask us how, what it means to be human individually and collectively is right here. It's in, it's at our finger fingertip, so to speak. Mm-hmm. It is the ground of our being, our present awareness. So where does this fit in? I, if I can mm. use that phrase within the realm of healing trauma, mm-hmm. someone comes to you, maybe they don't, even, maybe they come to you for depression or anxiety. They yeah. don't even realize they've been traumatized in the past. Mm-hmm. How, how sh- Give us an idea of how you work. Sure. Yeah. So people come to therapy with different levels of comfort around connecting to their bodies. As you acknowledge, there might be some people who come in thinking that they have a cognitive issue, so to speak. My thinking is dysfunctional. My thinking is broken. And at that point, I might invite a person to become curious about, about what's happening inside of them. 
titrating in kind of bringing in little bits at a time of sensory experience to ask a person to notice. And as we build the capacity to notice and tolerate what we find to also bring in curiosity about what that information might be telling us, because that information at first might feel difficult to be with. And because of that, we can build up defenses around it and want to run away from that information. But when we have an attuned other who can regulate us, who can help us be present to what's going on, we can have the courage to stay with it and realize that our bodies might be telling us information about what we've lived through. And instead of seeing those messages as problematic or proof that our bodies are bad, we can Mm -hmm. see those messages as proof that our body is asking us to heal something. It is saying, I'm giving you, I'm giving your conscious awareness, some information about what needs your attention, about what needs to be worked through in order for you to feel like you're whole again. So the things that we experience aren't problems to be solved, but are actually really important insights and messengers about the path forward. I'm speaking with Dr. Hillary McBride. Her most recent book is titled The Wisdom of Your Body, Finding Wholeness, Healing, and Connection Through Embodied Living. It came out in the fall of 2021. Um, You're intense. (laughs) You're intense. I mean, tell me about that. (laughs) It feels to me that what Uh you are doing is really taking the the you know use of the body or the Mm. the experience of the body the acceptance of the body and really honoring that in a way Mm. in in a really profound way for people Mm. i mean i have a lot of people come on and they talk about you know the body's role in the healing of trauma and so forth but what you seem to be doing Hillary from my perspective is almost supercharging that Mm. and almost really inviting people to not just see the body's role or to experience the body's role, but it it feels, it feels very profound what you're saying. Oh, wow. Mm, is that what you meant by intense? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that was my <laughs> lack of being able to find a, a better word. Oh, I loved it. I but, loved it. <laughs> but it's true. It's, it's, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's just undeniable. Mm. Oh, thank you for, for reflecting that back to me. It, it, that feels like an accurate representation of the way that I, I want to center this content in my work um, and to my friends and families kind of dismay at times, this is my favorite thing to talk about, even at the dinner table on holidays. They're like, but can we talk about something other than trauma? <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. Okay. <laughs> but I think um, what I borrow a lot from Merleau-Ponty's work because Merleau-Ponty, Maurice, Maurice Merleau-Ponty was a philosopher and child psychologist um, from the last century who was really important in helping us see that, that we had forgotten the body when we were considering what it meant to be a self, right? We've got Descartes and we've got platonic thinking and we've got the way that this kind of um, Gnosticism was woven into our Western way of understanding what it means to be a self and what it means to be alive. And that impacted continental philosophy and existentialism to the point that this, the view of the self was so fragmented out from the body that we thought that it existed somewhere exclusively in the mind or in this kind of astral projection, or maybe even for some people in the next life, whatever happens after the body stops existing is where life or the self really starts. And Merleau-Ponty, at least as I understand it, was really important in saying among, you know, of course, a whole community of womanist thinkers and indigenous scholars and medicine people who had been saying from the beginning, Hey, a fragmented existence actually doesn't work for anybody, but in terms of Western philosophy and my, my line of training, Merleau-Ponty was really important in saying the body is not just an object. The body is a subject we have. There is a kind of, um, beingness to our bodies that we neglect when we think of ourselves as this bifurcated human that is just a mind carried around by tissue. 
And of course, now we have the updated neuroscientific knowledge to say that cognition itself is embodied and that, you know, there is so much more information going from body to brain than there is from brain to body in terms of where we are getting our data to decide both how we perceive the world and how we interact with the world that we're perceiving. And then of course, there's the other layer of other people's bodies reflecting back to us experiences that our bodies introcept or that are, sorry, that our bodies kind of take, take in and assess to, to really figure out, are are we safe? Are we not safe? Mm -hmm. So much of the social referencing that goes on in terms of how our body regulates itself, but there is, there is a beingness to our body that we have forgotten in our culture. And when we neglect that, that beingness, we're missing cues to our healing, like I've been saying, but Mm -hmm. also a really important ingredient for us to be able to thrive, to feel like we're whole again. I just want to write down here before I I miss it here, Mm -hmm. the the beingness to our, to our body, because I love that Mm -hmm. phrase here. How has your experience and, and the work you've done, uh, kind of educated you about Mm. your own body and being this. Oh my goodness. Wow. I mean, it's constant. And this is such a a benefit of doing this work with people all the time is that I'm, I am reminded of the things that I also believe there's something about being a therapist and a parent Mm -hmm. who, you know, you, you try to say the things that are most important, the things that you believe to be most true, sometimes, even if they feel inaccessible to you. And in practicing the experiences with other people, I feel like they live inside of me so much more. So I would say to be in my body, in my clinical work, in a way that invites other people to be in their bodies has demanded that I am patient, that I'm gentle, that I'm curious with myself to be, to be investigative, but with a loving gaze of what's happening inside of me. I've realized over time is, is not just a part of how I show up most fully with my clients, but also gives me clinical data about what might be happening for them Mm -hmm. because of mirror neuron, right? The the research that we know about how my body might be reacting to something that's happening to somebody else's body. Sometimes my body is, is giving me clues into how to work well and effectively clinically. But I would say that there is something so important about believing that my body is worth paying attention to and not in a way that it's again, supersedes what's going on for other people, but in a way that it becomes part of the conversation. So I have more information to work with. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I notice, let's just say I'm sitting across from a patient who has something come up for them, or there's like an interpersonal thing that feels kind of a little bit off. I notice that my body gets tight. And when I'm paying attention to that, I get to be curious and say, is that about me? Is that about us? Is that about them? And how do I work with that information in a way that brings it into the room skillfully? But I would say it helps me actually have longevity to the work that I do, because instead of shutting off all of that data, when I'm working, it gets to be in the room and I get to work it through as it's happening. Can you share an early clinical error? Oh, (laughs) Oh. I mean, I'm just thinking of like the first one of, of course there are so many, um, I remember, and this is kind of an interesting thing that I still work on in supervision, but I remember I was practicing narrative, let like letter writing to a client. It was probably my first client ever in my, in my master's program. And I was writing him a summary of our sessions and I wrote maybe something like four pages of information. And I remember showing it to my supervisor before I brought it to the client in session. She's like, that's too much information. That's too much. (laughs) Like that's going to overwhelm him. And Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that I've been working on in supervision that relates to that is there is such thing as needing to titrate affection. There's such thing as needing to titrate the bigness of our delight in someone Mm -hmm. because receptive affect is a skill in itself. Being able to take in someone else's love for you is not something that a lot of people know how to do. Mm -hmm. They might be able to take in and be very sensitized to someone else's anger towards them, but can they take in care? Do they actually know how? So being able to titrate what I, what I love about clients and deliver it in a way that is 
accessible to them feels like something, I guess I'm realizing as I talk about this, I was working on then, but also still working on now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, as you're talking, I'm thinking to myself, you know, and I'll speak for myself. I mean, even on, you know, my best day, Uh it can be really challenging to experience my body or honor my body Uh in the way that I think we're we're talking about here. And I'm thinking, you know, for some people who've experienced interpersonal trauma, Mm -hmm. it it feels sometimes there, they can be working even from a a further deficit, like even to acknowledge that their body can be a challenge, you know, and you, you talked a little bit about how you work, but I'm just curious. Mm-hmm. There seems to be how do you how do you invite someone mm-hmm. to 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 even a- acknowledge to mm-hmm. increase their awareness of their body. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it can be such a tricky thing. Yeah. I think I love the practicality of this question as well by the way. I think that sometimes for clients who feel like their body is inaccessible to them and unsafe to them to even begin to experiment with, with noticing and paying attention to not even talking about honoring. I mean, that would feel so far down the road. We can act as the, the representation of the self for that client as the therapist, we can be the stand in for the person who knows how to do that. So what we can start by doing is saying, essentially, Um, I might use different language if I was talking to a a patient, but to say your body is safe to me and I can notice your body and it doesn't dysregulate me. And I can pay attention and believe that what the messages that your body is sending, you know, are good and worth paying attention to. So what that might be like, uh, really practically is to say, I saw you take a big breath there. I'm so glad that your body is telling us that there's a little bit of relief. Does that feel like the right word? Is that, you know, was it relief? How did you know? What is it about what I said that felt like it resonated inside? So using bodily cues and the person that we're micro attuned to and inviting that to be explicit in the room. And then I would, you know, because some of my training is an ADP, a, a really important skill set or um, technique in ADP is the meta therapeutic processing. So adding in something like, you know, how is it for you that I notice? Mm -hmm. How is it for you that I'm paying attention to your body, but I am being curious and non-judgmental. What is it like for you? Because for some people to be surveyed or to have their body noticed might feel really unsafe, but if they're paying attention to the fact that I'm doing it in a gentle, loving way, all of a sudden it might become clear that there are other ways of paying attention to the body. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Okay. People listening to this are therapists, they're, mm-hmm. uh, they're coaches, uh, they're people who've experienced trauma. They're both. Mm-hmm. Where, well, let me, before I ask you that question, where do you see the, the, uh, field of trauma treatment right now? I mean, mm. there's so many, there's a lot going on. There's so many interventions and modalities out there. Yeah. What's your, what's your take on the current state? Oh my goodness. Well, it's hard to talk about the current state of trauma treatment without also talking about this zeitgeist around psychedelic psychotherapy and that being reintroduced into the way that people are practicing, because I think we're realizing that there is, there is more ways. And as you mentioned that there are already a lot of ways, but I, you know, I think when I look at the buffet of options, even kind of the buffet of trainings that I've had to be able to work with people with various traumas that come into my practice, the thing that I think that we always need to come back to is how do we be in relationship with the person in front of us instead of trying to fit them and their trauma into the mold of, you know, the specific one training Mm -hmm. that we like to use, how do we, as the attachment figure in the room, adapt to them? How do we see the person and what they need and create a relationship and an environment in which the person has an opportunity to ask for what they need and talk about what works and what doesn't work. So I feel like it's much more important, particularly when we're working with people who have interpersonal trauma to be creating a space where people have a relational experience that undoes the trauma more than I think about any kind of technique that I need to use. 
And you could argue that that is a kind of intervention mm-hmm. to use relationship. But I think about that as being such an important part of how we develop as humans, we are wired to be in right. connection with other people that if, if the rest of the interventions are delivered in a really skillful, but misattuned way, it doesn't really actually seem like they're seeing the person. And I think that we run the risk of, um, being, being further re-traumatizing to someone. And then I think the other piece, in addition to like, how are we choosing interventions and how are we in relationship with someone is it's sometimes so intense for people to live their lives with all of this trauma, that there's an urgency to resolve it really, mm-hmm. really fast. And we can kind of jump the gun, so to speak, and miss how important slowing down and pacing is for trauma. So again, to create a new relationship or to be deeply attuned. So I'd say more important than the intervention is, can we create a relational container within a person, a person feels attuned to and heard, but can we move at a pace that allows us to drop into these experiences instead of, I would say is here's another clinical error of mine being so eager to help people in their distress that we pull out the big guns of therapy and a person gets flooded and re-triggered and doesn't have the skills to re-regulate themselves and things actually get way, way, way harder before they need to. Yeah. I love that response. How did, how long or, mm-hmm. or when did you understand that? When oh. did you, when did that become embodied for you? That, uh, yes. that realization, the pacing piece, well, the importance of the relationship, the importance of mm-hmm. you being you, being human in that room, as yeah. opposed to, you know, when I did, when I, when I first started, mm-hmm. of course, I guess a lot of people do, but I, me, I was clutching tight to my, my briefcase of interventions, you yes. know, yeah. and I me have too. to use this, of course, so I know how to use that. And I've got to do yeah. that. I have this degree, of course, you know, and uh-huh. I, I did not get anything of what, I mean, I kind of intellectualized uh, what you were saying, but it sure. didn't, didn't come home for me. Yes. But yeah. you, you know, someone listening to you now, they could very easily be thinking, oh my God, you know, Dr. McBride, that's the way she was born. Mm, it yeah. you just came out of the womb and you were this incredible, <laughs> you know, but, but was that the case? Do, how, right. When did you get there? Okay. A moment is coming to mind and I notice feeling, oh, I feel some sadness about it as I talk about it, because I realize in a way that I learned this lesson because I, I hurt somebody in the process and it was a rupture that we were able to repair. And I'm actually still working with this person, but I, I can feel the sadness that I had of, of my misattunement to them. It was a moment where I was inviting a person to do some EMDR processing. And this is a person who had a lot of interpersonal trauma and from early on in childhood. And we had a this point been into our clinical work for a couple of years before it felt safe to actually try doing this level of processing. And as we started doing the bilateral movements, um, it w- is that enough to say for, for your listeners, would people know enough about EMTR? To yeah, I think to so. That? Yeah, okay. Sure. As we, in, we get into kind of the procedure of EMDR, the client started to panic a little bit. And I had said, no, 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 this isn't like, it's okay. Go with it. Right. Like as we're trained to do notice that go with it, stay with it and let's keep going. And what she was trying to say. And what I didn't hear was like, no, I can't feel you because you're sitting just outside of my field of vision. You know, I have to look at your hand. I can't read you. I feel very alone in what's coming up for me because I was saying, just stay with it, just stay with it, just stay with it. And this is not like I use EMDR regularly in my practice. So this is not about EMDR being ineffective or harmful in itself, but my method of delivery was in a way, something that distanced me from her and what she needed as we were going into the intensity of her pain was to feel me closer, not to feel me further away. So it was after us kind of like trying that a little bit and her going, no, I, I hate it. I don't Mm -hmm. like it. And it's, this is why I cannot feel you that I was able to see one, how brave she was to tell me that. And the fact that our relation, the two, our relationship up until that point had given her the courage to trust me and know that if she said, I don't like this, I don't want to do it, that I would listen to her. Mm -hmm. So it was those two angles, the misattunement, but then also realizing the relationship was the resource 
that had helped her find her voice to say no. And what was interesting as we continue to process that was her no felt like a kind of a right, a novel experience in a relationship of, with someone who has power and authority figure, that it was a corrective experience to be able to say, I don't want you to do this and have her be listened to. Right. Thank you for sharing that. Mm, Sounds like it was okay. a pretty powerful experience on both of you. For both of parts. us. <laughs> yes. And this is, I mean, I think how therapy works when it is, it is doing its best thing is that we are also transformed. Like, I don't really ever want to enter into a therapeutic relationship with someone where my heart is closed off to being taught something by them. Um, okay. As we kind of wind down here, what's the Mm -hmm. best way for people to reach out to you, Hillary? Oh, sure. So you can find me on Instagram at Hillary Leanna McBride, Twitter, Hillary L. McBride, my website, Hillary L. McBride.com. And those are usually the best places to find out what I'm up to and get in touch with me. Okay. Okay. Now in terms of the book, uh, the wisdom of your body, finding wholeness, Mm -hmm. healing and connection through embodied living. Um, why did you write the book? I wrote the book because I've been talking about embodiment and what it means to be a body instead of just a mind that has a body for a number of years. And people kept saying, but where do I read about that? And I kept having to say, well, you can go to some primary source philosophy texts, but I don't really know where else you can go to learn about what that means. So it felt like there was a hole in, in the market, so to speak, that there was a gap in the literature that was accessible for people where we could understand how to be in relationship with ourselves in a new way. And who's the book for? The book is for humans, for of humans. course, <laughs> I would say, but beyond, beyond that for people who might have felt like the body was an unsafe place to be. And so they learned to dissociate and see themselves as just a mind or for those of us who grew up in this cultural language that we're all swimming in, that our bodies don't matter. They're an afterthought mm-hmm. or they're an object to be used, or they're a thing that needs to be conquered for us to be able to be successful and sufficient and proficient in our lives. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Look, Hillary, I mean, and there's so much to talk about. I'm, mm-hmm. I'd, I'd love to have you back. Thank you. Um, it would be an honor. Yeah. That would be awesome. Um, thank you so much. Oh. I appreciate it. Yeah. What a delight. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I'm so grateful. I know you do. You have these rich conversations with people who talk about this stuff all the time. And I just so appreciate your invitation and your presence with me. It was well, such a delight. Awesome. Likewise. Yeah. Um, let's, we'll, we'll talk again. Thank you so I much. Can't wait. You're all welcome. Right. Take care. Thank you so much for listening and supporting this podcast. And if you'd like to join the hundreds of other therapists who are each month keeping up to date and informed and inspired about what's going on in the world of trauma, I'd love to invite you to head on over to the Trauma Therapist Newsletter. That's the traumatherapistnewsletter.com.